welcome to our latest installment of the Living Room Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Hannah Zimmerman and I am the Marketing and Communications Director at Historic Lucas Group. And we're so pleased to have you step behind the Crimson Curtain this evening and explore Charles Peel's museum with us and Dr. Lee A. Jugatkin from the University of Louisville. Um, but before I hand things over to Dr. Jugatkin, I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Carol Ely, our Executive Director, to catch you up on some of the things happening at Locust Grove. Take it away, Carol. Hi, good evening. I'm glad that you could join us for the continuation of our, what used to be our Wednesday afternoon lecture series, but we've gotten way more creative during the pandemic. So glad that you could, could join us. We have a couple of pieces of good news to share. Uh, we uh, will be reopening after being closed to the public for a little more than two months. Uh, next week, March 4th, and we will be kind of unwinding what we did last fall as we gradually shut down, we'll be gradually opening up again. So starting Thursdays through Saturdays, we'll be offering a grounds tour. And that's a more comprehensive tour than you might assume. It really tells the entire story of Locust Grove, but through the lens of the grounds, not just the house. So if you've uh, been longing to do something that's outdoors and socially distanced, yet historical, that's the program for you. So we will run that for a while. We hope that within a month or so, we'll be able to start offering self-guided tours of the house again, but that is going to be dependent on the progress of the uh, COVID pandemic and of the vaccine. So far, only one person on our staff who's part-time has been vaccinated. So we're uh, only going to do this in a way that's safe, but we will continue to be offering virtual programming. However, one real in-person thing that we have just now put on our schedule and will be opening soon, I see Hannah clapping, uh, we will be opening soon for reservations is our uh, used book sale which we have done several times during the pandemic, safely distanced uh, limited numbers of people in the room at one time. Everyone makes a reservation in advance using our website. And that will be running uh, from Thursday through Sunday, March 18th to 21st and March 25th to 28th. That's eight days. That's so we can fit a lot of people in, but still maintain the low numbers of people in the room so that everybody feels safe. Masks, of course, required. So I hope if you're uh, getting tired of the books that you've been holed up with all winter, you'll come and uh, find some new things to, to read at our book sale. The other good news is, and while we haven't sent an official announcement, you'll be the first to know, construction has finally started on our pavilion and the other projects that we have been talking about for, it seems, half a decade now. It may actually be half a decade. Uh, we are building an event pavilion right next to the auditorium. And while they haven't actually put a shovel in the ground yet, the uh, locust grove is fenced in like you wouldn't believe. And uh, they've dropped up a lot of building materials. And so for the next six months or so, there will be some disruption on the site due to construction. The interior of the building is, is going to be uh, the, uh, the interior of the house would be the same. The interior of the visitor center, let's say, um, maybe a little bit constricted as we move everything out of storage and pile it up in the hallways, but uh, we uh, continue, we will continue to operate. We don't see a reason to have to stop operating if there is, if for a short period of time we don't have electricity. Well, they didn't have electricity in the 18th century either. So we'll be fine. Uh, so uh, we look forward to gradually opening up and at the end of that process, having some new facilities for you to enjoy. So that's my good news for today. And now I think you probably want to hear more about Peel's Museum. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, I uh, put some links in the chat um, so that you can um, learn more about our capital campaign and what this um, construction is all about. Um, and also, as Carol mentioned, uh, the book sale signups will open tomorrow through our email list. Um, so the only way you can currently sign up for a book sale uh, signups is um, through our email list. Our, we have a weekly email that goes out every um, Friday at 6 p.m. So that's when signups open. I put a link. If you're not already on the email list, you can sign up tonight um, and you will get um, the general public who's not on our mailing list won't find out about the book sale until Monday. 
So be the first um, to know. We'll also just a quick reminder, you're asking questions through the chat um, or you can email them to me at marketing at locustgrove.org. Please keep your microphones um, and videos turned off. And without further ado, Dr. Lee Dugatkin, are you ready to be introduced? I am ready. I'm looking forward All to it. All right. Um, Dr. Lee A. Dugatkin is an evolutionary biologist and historian of science in the Department of Biology at the University of Louisville. He has lectured about his research and his books at more than 175 venues around the world, including New Zealand, Australia, Mongolia, Cuba, Russia, Romania, Turkey, the Czech Republic, Croatia, Taiwan, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Norway, and roughly 160 other countries. I'm the author, he is the author of nine books and more than 175 papers in such journals as Nature, The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and The Proceedings of the Royal Society of London. And he's a contributing author to Scientific American, The New Scientist, The Washington Post, um, and The American Scientist. The New York Times called his book, How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog, a story that is part science and part Russian fairy tale. Um, and he's also written um, the book, uh, several other books, and I'm going to link to those in the chat. But this evening, he is here to present to us Behind the Crimson Curtain, The Rise and Fall of Steel's Museum. Please take it away, Dr. Bugatkin. We're so pleased to have you with us. Well, thank you so much. And, and, and thank you, Hannah and Carol and everybody at uh, Locust Grove for, for setting this up. Uh, I, uh, I would love it if we were actually uh, all together in the same room, but uh, this is a small accommodation to have to pay given the sacrifices that so many are, are, are taking on during this pandemic. So I, I'm thrilled to do this on Zoom or any way that I can uh, chat with you a little bit. I've really been looking forward to this um, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, um, I'm, I adore Historic Locust Grove. Um, I've spent many afternoons just roaming around the beautiful grounds there, and I'm always uh, first online for the book sale, where you might imagine from my background right here that I, I, I love books and, I, and I'm always there. And, and if there's some sort of rule that uh, people who give uh, living room lectures get uh, access to the first early night uh, auctions. That, that's great. No, I, I'm just kidding there. Um, but, uh, but I'm really looking forward to this um, as well because I just adore telling this story of uh, Charles Wilson Peale's Enlightenment Shrine in Philadelphia in the early days of the American Republic. And so I just wanted you to see there was a human being behind the talk right now. And so Hannah, if you could turn off my video now, I will start the slide share. Um, and I just will need, I, I will just need then about uh, 10 seconds to move over, um, shift my computer, and then you will have your slides on there um, in, in, in just a moment. And I will be- It's like, it's like we're peeking behind the curtain. This is very exciting. Exactly, exactly. So hang on now. Um, gosh, I assume it's this one. Uh, let's see now. Are you in fact seeing, oh no, now I have to actually uh, start my presentation here. Hang on. So now are you seeing one slide on, on there? On Hannah, sure I sure am. We sure are. Okay, all right, very good. So we are ready to get we're going. good to go i will let you know if anything weird happens very good very good so you are looking right now at a painting called the artist in his museum and it is if not the single most famous painting from the early days of the united states certainly one of the most famous um it's a self-portrait that was made by Charles Wilson Peale standing there in the middle in what was known as the long room of his museum. Uh, the museum was already 36 years old when the, uh, when the painting you're looking at was painted by Peale and Peale was 81 when he painted it. And um, this talk is gonna be both about the proprietor, Charles Wilson Peale, and about his museum and about um, sort of an enlightenment philosophy in the early, United States. And so, um, let's see here, very good. Uh, this museum in Philadelphia was in fact the first true museum in the United States. 
first and foremost, it was a natural history museum. So at the uh, little marks here, you see all of those exhibits that, um, that lined the wall on the left there. Down at the bottom, you see the taxidermy kit that Peel used to put some of these exhibits together. And over here, behind the crimson curtain on the top right key is a giant mammoth. Uh, it was actually a mastodon, but they were calling it a mammoth. And you see other mammoth bones sitting there as well. Now, for Peel, this was a secular shrine an Enlightenment temple. It was more than a natural history museum, and other people saw it that way as well. So a French Count Volnay talked about Peel's museum as a place that housed nothing but truth and reason. So in addition to the natural history exhibits at this museum, there was the art. So there you see the palette that Peel and his sons used to produce many of the paintings that hung up on the wall in this museum. What's more, it was a museum that was designed for the general public. This wasn't one of those museums that you might see in London that was essentially for the upper crust. This was a museum that was designed for everybody. So, and Peel wanted to capture that in the artist in his museum. So if we zoom in a bit, what we see here in Peel's painting is a gentleman standing there studying the museum specimens. We see a woman in a bonnet staring over at the mammoth behind the crimson curtain. And we see a father and a son where the father's got his arm around his little boy, presumably teaching him about natural history and art as he does. So let's step back. And I wanna give you a little bit of history about how this museum um, came to be and, and the importance that, that it, um, that, that came to it over the years. So Peel was actually born in Annapolis in 1741. And by the time he was 21, he was really, really interested in painting. But by his own admission, he was a rank amateur. He wrote that he didn't even know what colors to buy at paint stores. But at 21, he was showing um, the, first, the first hints of being the autodidact that he would develop into. And so what he basically did was borrow or buy every book about painting that he could get his hands on. Books by famous painters like Joshua Reynolds and others. And he starts to paint and he, he paints a few, paint, uh, he paints a few uh, portraits of famous people in Annapolis and not so famous people in Annapolis. But eventually this fellow John Beale Bordley, who was um, one of the richest, most powerful people in Annapolis, learned of Peel's paintings and really liked what he saw. And he wrote to his friends in 1766 that something must and shall be done for Charles. And so what he and his friends, including the governor of the state of Maryland, Horatio Sharp did, was sponsor Peel to sail over to England and study in the studio of arguably England's most famous painter, Benjamin West. So Peel sails over there in 1766. He spends two years studying under Benjamin West and sails back to the United States where he already now has a growing reputation as one of the protégés of the most famous artist in England. So not long after that, Martha Washington, sits for a miniature portrait. And soon after that, Peel convinces her that Colonel Washington should also sit for him. And Peel remembers this very, very well. It was one of, um, in the end, about 30 different paintings he did of Washington, but it was a, one of the first ones. And he remembers, it was the first one. And he remembers being there as a, as a young man. And while he was there, 
some of the younger people around were playing this game called pitch the bar. And basically it was who could throw this iron bar farther than anybody else. And Peel joined in and he remembers Colonel Washington coming over, throwing the iron bar farther than anyone else and turning around saying, when you can beat my pitch, young gentleman, I will try again. So Peel paints Washington, he ends up painting um, more and more people. And um, a few years later in 1774, he takes his family and they move to Philadelphia. A couple of years after that, he's actually asked by John Hancock, the president of the Continental Congress, to do a full length portrait of the new commander in chief, Washington. So his reputation is growing. Um, he and his wife, they rent this house on Arch Street. Um, he opens up a small little studio in the back. Um, people are coming to see this. John Adams writes Abigail that Peel was a tender, soft, affectionate man, that he was, in fact, ingenious. A few years later, in 1780, um, Peel and his family buy a home on Lombard Street in Philadelphia. And there's the home right there. And um, what, Peel's, what Peel does is he builds a 66 foot long extension at the back of the house that will serve as a large scale gallery for his paintings. And in 1782, he advertises it in the Pennsylvania packet and others are writing stories about this. Um, they talk about Peel's new exhibition room, open for reception and entertainment of all lovers of the fine arts being ornamented with portraits of a great number of worthy personages. So, so far we're just talking about a painting gallery. And that begins to change when Peel is commissioned to sketch these bones that you're looking at here. These were bones that Peel and everyone of the day called mammoth bones. Technically, we've come to call them, uh, to learn that they're in fact mastodon bones, but I'm going to use the word mammoth bones because that was the term that was used then. Uh, these bones actually came from Big Bone Lick. And what had happened was Peel was commissioned to, to sketch these for, for somebody. And he was sketching them, and his brother-in-law, Nathaniel Ramsey, Colonel Nathaniel Ramsey, came to visit while he was sketching this. And um, Nathaniel told him um, he thought these bones were so interesting that he would have come 20 miles to take a look at it. But what really caught Peel's attention was when Nathaniel Ramsey turned to him and said, Doubtless, there are many men like myself who would, who would prefer seeing such articles to, um, to uh, I'm sorry, uh, such articles, uh, I'm getting this strange thing where my, um, hang on just one second, my, uh, I'm trying to move something that's appearing on my screen, uh, but that's okay, I can't do it. Okay, um, so he said that, um, uh, he would, doubtless there are many men like myself who would prefer seeing such articles of curiosity than any paintings whatsoever, and it would be little trouble to keep them and the public gratified in the sight at such times as they came to see the paintings. In other words, he thought that people would essentially pay to come see both the paintings and the bones themselves. And this notion of pairing natural history, in this case through the mammoth bones, with um, with art really got Peel's mind racing. And what he did was he began to solicit from his friends and colleagues uh, natural history exhibits. And if you excuse me, I'm, I apologize just for one second. You can't see something that I'm seeing on my screen here. I'm trying to make it go away and let's see if I can. I doubt it. Okay, I can't, that, that's fine. I apologize for that little thing. Um, so Peel starts putting out the word that um, he would like to start collecting these natural history exhibits and pair them with the art that he's showing in his gallery. 
and people start to respond. His collection begins to grow. These are pheasants that George Washington sent him. The Marquis de Lafayette had given these dead pheasants that were from the aviary of Louis the 16th to the Marquis and the Marquis sent them to Peel. Benjamin Franklin sent the stuffed body of an Angora cat that he had gotten from some of his associates in Paris. And other people were sending things and Peel was collecting them on his own and from his hunting and from his sons going out and collecting things out in the wild, waterfowl and fish and turtles and snakes. And, and so the, the collection was starting, the natural history collection was starting to go alongside the art. Art of Washington now, of Benjamin Franklin, of Thomas Paine, of Lafayette, and of about 30 of the leading um, people in early American history. A few years later, Peel has both enough paintings and enough interesting natural history exhibits that he opens up a small museum and he advertises it in the July 7th, 1786 Pennsylvania packet where it says, Mr. Peel ever desires to please and entertain the public will make part of his home a repository for natural curiosities. The public, he hopes, will thereby be gratified in the sight of many of the wonderful works of nature which are now closeted, but seldom seen. The several articles we placed and arranged according to their several species, and for the greater ease to the curious on each piece will be inscribed the place from whence it came and the name of the donor. Mr. Peel will thankfully receive the communications of friends who will favor him with their assistance in this undertaking. So for Peel, this was sort of a community project, right? He was building the museum. He had the space for it, but he was soliciting constantly in the newspapers for people to send him more and more natural history specimens. And of course, he was continuing his portrait painting, adding to that side of the equation. This is the first ticket to the museum, which Peel designed by, um, by himself. And um, you can see on the top is uh, the Book of Nature. And you can see that it emits the bearer to Peel's museum, um, where uh, they will see wonderful works of nature and curious works of art. And on the bottom, you can see it cost about a quarter to get in, 25 cents. And Peel thought of this place as an enlightenment temple, a place that he described as one that would bring into one view a world in miniature. There was nothing like this in the United States at this time. This was really the first true museum in the country. And for Peel, it was designed to enlighten the minds of my countrymen and to demonstrate the importance of diffusing a knowledge of the wonderful and various beauties of nature, to render the institution a lasting honor and benefit to America. So he saw this place in a very patriotic light amongst other things. And Peel bemoaned the fact that European museums were very limited in their reach. They tended to reach as Peel described it, particular classes of society only, open at such turns or at such portions of time as effectually to disbar the mass of society from participating. And, and Peel was not going to let that happen in his museum. This museum would be open to the wise as well as, the unwise as well as the learned. It was there for everybody. And so, Peel would constantly be placing advertisements in the newspaper to bring people in to take a look at this museum. Almost every week, the Pennsylvania Packet would publish pieces that Peel put in there where he would talk about new museum acquisitions from China, Africa, India, Pacific Islands, North and South America. Every week, they would be learning about new hummingbirds and birds of paradise and parakeets and pelicans that were coming in, snipes and swans and sparrows and bluebirds, black panthers and mink and opossums and sharks and porcupine fish and tiger skulls and another four pound tooth of a mammoth. The museum was growing and it was growing really 
quickly. And it wasn't just a place where there was art and natural history, but it was also a museum of anthropology and ethnography. Here is a photo of a Tahitian feather cap that was donated by George Washington to the museum. There were also in the museum eventually, within the first decade, fans and weapons from East India, a bow from Madagascar, a sword from Damascus, a mandarin pipe from China, a piece uh, from the Bastille prison, Native American canoes, South American ba uh, baskets, and so, so much more. By the early 1790s, Peel has put together a board of directors that is going to help him with this museum. Because the museum, even at this point, just five years after it opened, had an annual attendance of somewhere between 3,500 and 12,000 people. It's a little difficult to, to, to say it anymore um, with any more accuracy than that. But, but, the, but those numbers, given that the entire Philadelphia area had 54,000 people are, are, are really strong support for, for, the, for the early version of the museum. So Peel puts together this board of directors and it includes everybody and every, anyone and everybody in, um, of importance in, in Philadelphia. So Alexander Hamilton is on the board, James Madison who is, who, who's up in Philadelphia occasionally visiting, Governor Morris, David Rittenhouse who is the president of the American Philosophical Society and perhaps most importantly, um, Peel's uh, friend, Thomas Jefferson. So the board of, of directors is in place. Hundreds and hundreds of new uh, natural history specimens are coming in monthly. Peel is adding um, portraits that he's doing of, of, uh, of famous people constantly. And, and the museum has grown so much that by 1794, um, Peel needs more space. The gallery in his house, um, now the museum in his house, is it simply just does not have enough space for him. And so what he ends up doing is renting Philosophical Hall. This is the place that is run by the American Philosophical Society. Um, and you see um, Philosophical Hall in the back there um, in the red square. Uh, and so Peel in 1794 uh, moves his museum to Philosophical Hall. Now, I, we only have so much time, so I really can't get into the incredible parade that Peel created for over the course of two weeks where he had little boys and everybody from little boys to men carrying different exhibits from his home to Philosophical Hall to drum up interest in the museum now that it's in its new home in Philosophical Hall. And it's not only the museum's new home, but Peel moves his family into the basement of that building so they can manage and run the museum from their home. In 1797, Peel makes the first pitch for his Philadelphia Museum to become a national museum. So in a publication that he spreads around all the newspapers, he writes, I've, de I've always declared that the museum was, de was designed for the benefit of America. Have I not been persevering more for the public good than for my own emolument? I I'm doing this for the people as well as for myself. And Peel wrote that such a public good ought to become a national concern since it is a national good. For the very sinews of government are made strong by a diffuse knowledge of this science. Peel thought that an enlightened society needed a government from the city level to the state level to the national level that would support things like a natural history, art, anthropology, ethnography museum. And of course his was the only one that was there. And this was his first pitch. In fact, this becomes something of an obsession with Peel to make the museum a national museum. And we'll see more about that as we go on. But before we do, I wanna return now, like Peel did, to the mammoth that we touched on earlier. Because in 1800, Peel read about this treasure of mammoth bones that had been found in a marl pit on John Mastin's farm in Newburgh, New York. 
And the newspapers around there were running tantalizing headlines like the bones of a mammoth or some under, other wonderful creature have been found, writing a monster so vastly disproportionate to every creature as to induce a momentary suspension of everyday faculty, but admiration and wonder. A fearful figure is head extended to the summit of an ordinary tree. He could seize his prey if sheltered among its branches. Peel reads in the same article that the bones discovered lay buried about uh, under about 10 feet of marl and earth. But what really caught his attention was what came next in the advertisement. There were now prospects, the article reads, of procuring the whole of the skeleton. Nothing but want of exertions or means to defray expenses will hinder the whole of them from being secured. And Peel thought, who better than him to procure and piece together a full mammoth for the first time ever? It would be an over-the-top prize for his museum that would be sure to enlighten the public and at the same time generate sales for the uh, ticket sales for the museum. And this was a man who certainly did not want of exertions and his credentials for this were unmatched. Natural historian, curator of the only true natural history museum in the United States. So on the morning of June 5th, 1881, P.L. boards a stagecoach in Philadelphia heading um, for New York City. Um, he works his way then up, uh, up the Hudson to, um, to Newburgh and he gets to John Mastin's farm and before him on the floor, Peel sees tons of mammoth bones, head and neck and the greater part of three legs, also the bones of the hips of a mammoth. So Peel inquires from Ma uh, Mastin and the family, um, how much would it cost to allow him to come here and try and dig up the rest of the mastodon? And they tell him to make an offer, he does, and after a bit of horse trading, they strike a deal that Peel can come up with a team of people, including um, some of his sons, and begin a dig. This is another one of the most famous paintings of the early American Republic. This is again, Charles Wilson Peel's, and this comes from a few years after the Mastodon dig, and it's called the Exhumation of the Mammoth or the Exhumation of the Mastodon. And what you can see is Peel put together this incredible team. So first of all, you see all these workers who, who are down in these mall pits looking for bones. And you also see this giant machine that Peel built that he called the crab. And it was a, it was, um, a 20 foot in diameter circle that would move around. And as it did, it was lifting up these 1.5 gallon buckets full of water that were siphoning the marl pit so that the workers could in fact look for the bones. And the wheel was powered. What made it spin around was there were men who Peel paid a dollar a day to walk in there and as he, as Peel described it, as in a squirrel cage. And so this is how they dug up the bones of the mammoth. In fact, Peel dug them up here and in a couple of other places, and it took quite a bit of time and effort and money, but in the end, he succeeded. And he got the bones of a full mammoth. And in fact, he found enough bones to put together not just one mammoth, but two full mammoth skeletons. Here's a sketch that Peel's son, Rembrandt Peel, who would, become, would go on to become a, an even more famous artist than his father, but here was just a young man and Rembrandt sketched out what the um, mammoth look like. Um, this dig created this uh, a mammoth craze in the United States where people talked about mammoth squashes and mammoth radishes, mammoth cheeses. In fact, a, a group of farmers in Chester, Massachusetts 
milked enough cows that they created a 1300 pound, what they referred to as mammoth cheese that they sent to Thomas Jefferson in Washington as president of the United States as an abbreviation of the passion of, passion of republicanism. This, and Peel had created this, this mammoth craze in the United States. So the skeleton is ready to show in the museum by 18, late uh, 1801 in December 1801. And this was not gonna be an ordinary display. The uh, mammoth was given its own room in the museum at Philosophical Hall, and people had to pay an extra 50 cents in addition to the normal quarter to see it. What's more, it was placed next to a little mouse in order for people to get a, just a scale of the size of this mammoth. The other mammoth, its doppelganger, went on a tour of England, and that tour was led by two of Peel's sons, including Rubens, who you see here on the right. So the mammoth is causing this giant stir, both um, in the museum and in England. And so Peel thinks this is the perfect time again to make this pitch that this museum needs to be a national museum. It needs to be viewed as a national treasure. Now, by this time, Peel and Thomas Jefferson, President Jefferson, are very close friends. And over the years, they would exchange hundreds of letters. So Peel now reaches out to President Jefferson. And he writes Jefferson, the laborious though pleasing task of mounting the mammoth skeleton being done gives me leisure to attend to other interests of the museum. And huddled together, my exhibits, they lose much of their beauty and usefulness. They can't be seen to their full advantage for study. There are so many of them now that even philosophical hall is not big enough to hold them all. What he needed, Peel said, was space and money a means to dispose them for exhibition and public, and public utility. The art, the ethnography, the anthropology, the natural history. He tells Jefferson in the same letter that what he wants is in the end that these labors would be crowned a national, um, would be crowned in a national establishment of my museum. Then Peel floats the idea of a true national museum, his museum in the country's new capital of Washington, DC. And writes Jefferson, I wish to know your sentiments on this subject, whether the United States would give encouragement and make provision for the establishment of my museum in the city of Washington. The museum is now well known enough but this is not an outrageous thing for, for Peel to, to, uh, to come to Jefferson with. And certainly Jefferson knew the importance of the museum. And he was sympathetic to Peel's call for this becoming a national museum, potentially in Washington. So Jefferson writes his friend, no person on, person on earth can entertain a higher idea than I do of the value of your collection nor give you more credit for the unwearied perseverance and skill with which you have prosecuted it. And I very much wish it to be public property. He wants this to happen. But Jefferson claims his hands are tied by Congress. I must not suffer my partiality to excite false expectations in you, he writes Peel, which might eventually be disappointed. You know, Jefferson writes, that one of the great questions which has divided political opinion in this country is whether Congress is authorized by the Constitution to apply the public money to any but the purposes specifically enumerated in the Constitution. This, of course, was a giant issue in the early days of the Republic. And many have denied that Congress has any power to establish a national academy. Some people have been pushing for a national university. And if they couldn't do that, then they certainly, Jefferson was going to say, could not do a national museum. Jefferson says that even the few in Congress who would support federal aid for such worthy endeavors, it, those people, I'm persuaded the purchase of your museum would be the first object on which it would be exercised, even before a national university. But, Jefferson adds, I believe the opinion of a want of power to be that of the majority of the legislature. My hands are tied, Jefferson tells him. I can't, I, I can't make this happen. I, I wish I could. In fact, Eventually, I'd like it to become part of a university that I'm planning out in my home state of Virginia. 
So Peel is disappointed, he, um, but he understands. He writes, or at least he says he does. He writes, your communication has satisfied my mind and is, as it seems from the present nature of the constitution that this would be an unproductive effort. But that's not going to stop him from making the museum even more than it already was. And again, he needed space. So eventually he procured more space. And what he did was he had some of the museum remain in the American Philosophical Society's Hall, Philosophical Hall. But he also got the entire second floor of the State House as another part of the museum in 1802. Now to put this into perspective, that means that Peel's museum, the first museum in the United States, was sitting one floor above the room where the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were debated and signed, and one floor below what today we would refer to as the Liberty Bell. That's how central this museum had become to the United States. So years go by and by 1810, Peel is now 69 years old and the museum has been opened for 24 years and he decides that it's time to pass the torch. That he is going to retire and he writes Jefferson that his only wish is that the museum be, be well managed without my attention to it. And so what he does is he puts his son Rubens in charge. Now to be you know, to be completely accurate here, Peel says he just wants to retire and let somebody else handle the museum. But in fact, he's doing a lot of things behind the scenes um, to help Rubens as he takes over the museum. When Rubens takes it over in 1810, the museum is flourishing. Sale, ticket sales are the highest they've ever been. There are literally hundreds and thousands of new specimens being sent in. The number of paintings has dramatically increased. Right? So for example, there are 300 quadrupeds, more than 900 birds in the museum, amphibians, 4,000 insects, minerals, fossils, shells, collections of dresses and arms and utensils of, an, of the inhabitants of almost every part of the earth. 90 paintings now of, quote, the most men distinguished in the American Revolution and other dignified characters, another 150 paintings scattered throughout the museum, most if not all of them made by Peel, Charles Wilson Peel or his son Rembrandt, some of them made by Rubens. The museum has a printing press, a library stocked with treaties on natural history, various apparatuses that are used during um, public lectures that are given at the museum. So I'm gonna go back here. And um, the museum now has so many specimens that in fact, even the Philosophical Hall and the State House can't house them all. And so what Peel's son Rembrandt Peel says is, what I'd like to do now is basically open a spin-off museum, a spin-off Peel museum. I will open one in Baltimore. And he does that in 1815. Here's the ticket for the Peel Baltimore Museum. This museum was in fact the first building that from the blueprint stages was designed as a museum, right? So the Philadelphia Museum is much bigger and has many more things, but in fact, you know, it's in the Philosophical Hall and it's in the State House, which are very prominent places. But Rubens' spin-off museum is in fact the first building that from scratch, from design was built as a museum. And that building still exists today as the Peel Center in Baltimore. And it stopped with art and natural history exhibits and ethnography and anthropology, most of which has been shipped over from the Philadelphia Museum from duplicates or things that they simply didn't have enough space to house. Some of it Rembrandt acquired on his own. Back at the Philadelphia branch, one of Peel's other sons is now helping Rubens run the place. Titian is now doing 
that. He's a young man and he is helping his brother Rubens after he himself had gone on a number of major exp natural history expeditions around the United States. Now, eventually Rubens tires of running the Peale Museum in Philadelphia in part because he just wanted new horizons, but also in part because his father still had, he thought, Rubens thought, a little bit too strong a hand in the museum. And so what Rubens does is he now opens a second PL spin-off museum, this one in New York City called PL's New York Museum and Gallery of Fine Arts. And again, it's stocked with duplicates and extra pieces from the Philadelphia Museum. And again, some pieces that Rubens himself acquired. It's located at 225, 252 Broadway, right across the street from City Hall. So by 1825, there's the major PL Museum in Philadelphia, and there are spinoffs in Baltimore and New York City. All along, Charles Wilson Peel continues to make this pitch that the Philadelphia Museum needs to be a national museum. Over and over he makes this pitch and over and over again, he's disappointed and it doesn't happen. Two years later, after two years after Rubens opens the New York City Museum in 1827, Charles Wilson Peel dies. He certainly knew that his museum had made its mark, more than its mark, but it never got the national status as a national treasure that he wanted. So back in Philadelphia, Tishing is now firmly at the helm. Time goes by. We're now in the early 1840s and there's trouble brewing for the Peel Museums. And that trouble is in the form of P.T. Barnum. So in 1842, P.T. Barnum opens his American Museum in New York City. And I've highlighted um, the, the, the banner for the museum in red in the slide. And this museum is all too close to the Peel New York Museum the one that Rubens and now others are running. Barnum's American Museum is a giant smash and it has everything from legitimate exhibits to things like the Fiji mermaid. In a classic Barnum-esque overstatement, PT said that 15,000 people a day were visiting the museum. That was clearly way more than we're visiting, but it was drawing huge crowds constantly and basically sucking off everyone who might instead have gone to the Peel Museum. And eventually Rubens and the others who are running the New York City Museum, they just can't compete. And Barnum buys up all of the exhibits in the Peel New York City Museum. A few years later, the same story unfolds in Baltimore. The Peel Museum there never really took off in terms of drawing in huge crowds. It basically barely made ends meet. In the early 1840s, they couldn't do it anymore. P.T. Barnum hears about it buys it lock, stock, and barrel. And now he's acquired both the New York and the Baltimore museums. And he is acquiring little dime shows and other smaller museums all around, sort of building this Barnum dynasty. Then in the spring of 1849, Barnum comes to Philadelphia. 
And he opens Barnum Museum in the Swain Building in Philadelphia, which is just a few blocks away from the Peel Philadelphia Museum. Now the Philadelphia Museum, at this point, Charles Wilson Peel has been dead more than two decades. The museum did fine for a bit of time after Peel died, but it had been on the decline now for a while in the sense that it just wasn't pulling in the people that it used to. People um, were more interested in these kind of dime store, dime, dime museums where you could go in and, and, and see sort of extravagant over the top sort of things. The sort of thing that Barnum did. He opens up this museum in the Swain building and he tells his partner, Moses Kimball, that in no time he'd kill the other shop in the area and the other shop being Peel's Museum. On the right here, you're looking at the last home of the Philadelphia Museum. It actually moved a couple of times after Peel's death. Um, this is the last home on 9th and Sanson Street. Um, and in 1849, um, they, just, they just couldn't keep it open anymore. They just, they just were not generating the revenue that was necessary. So the United States Bank holds a public auction of all of the items in the Peel Philadelphia Museum. The museum runs its last advertisement on August 27th, 1849. The auction happens. P.T. Barnum's there, he buys everything, lock, stock and barrel for, as he writes in account, his account book, five or $6,000 on joint account of Moses Kimball and myself. So Barnum now has taken over all three of the Peel Museum. The exhibits that were in all three Peel museums, it, it's, it's not easy to sort of track them. Right? But what appears to have happened is that when Barnum got his hands on them, most of them ended up in his American Museum in New York City, and some of them in the Philadelphia Museum that he had in the Swain building. Both of those places burnt to the ground. The Swain Building in 1851, the American Museum in 1865. And with it, most of the exhibits that were in the Peel Museum. Now, fortunately, some of the ones that Moses Kimball got, he either gave or sold to um, Harvard University. And so if you go to the Anthropology Museum at Harvard University, you will see the largest collection of exhibits that were in fact in one of the Peel museums. It's not a giant exhibition, but it's the largest one of the natural history exhibits. Uh, it's the largest one of any of the natural history um, exhibits that would have been in one of Peel's museums. Now, things fared a bit better for the paintings that were in these museums because basically what the bank ended up doing was selling about 200 of those, um, those portraits to the city of Philadelphia. So in fact, I was just up there a few years ago. You can go all across Philadelphia, in the, Phil in the museums, in the banks, everywhere you go, you will see Peel portraits. You'll also see them, of course, in, the, in, in, in Washington and that, in the natural, nat, uh, National Portrait Gallery, but you'll see hundreds of them scattered across Philadelphia. So the paintings did okay, the uh, natural history and ethnography and anthropology exhibits, the vast majority of them are lost except for a few that were, that are now at um, the Harvard Anthropology Museum. So, if we now return to Peel's portrait of the artist in his museum, and we see all that he's done, I want to make the argument that this was more than the first major museum in the United States. Peel genuinely thought of it as an enlightenment shrine, a place that was designed to enlighten the American public that needed to be a national treasure. We've seen that that never happened. Instead, they went the way of P.T. Barnum. 
And I just want people to stop and think maybe after this talk about the state of museums and, 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 and the arts and sciences in general in our own society. How difficult it is to keep museums and science collections and the like open. Peel argued that an enlightened society is obliged to support those sorts of things, that everything from the city and state to the national level. Otherwise, we're in trouble. Otherwise, today, such places will ultimately fall prey to modern day P.T. Barnum's. So I will stop here and be happy to take questions. And so what I'm going to do in just a moment, if you could do me a favor, Hannah, and I'm going to stop my screen share for a minute now, yeah, I hope, um, or if you can, that would be good. And turn off my video, turn off my video just yeah. for a moment. Screen share, and there you go. And there's your video. All right. Hello. No, 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 let's see. Um, uh, so I'm on here. What I, I guess I will just uh, stay seated and, and, and not go back to where I was. Um, that's fine. And um, oh. so I am you know, delighted to, uh, um, to. I We have so many. We have several questions showing up in the chat. I have so many questions in my brain. First of all, thank you so much. Um, that was such a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm such a museum nerd. That's why I work in museums. And so it's a lot of fun to um, it's a lot of fun to get to um, to hear about early museums. Um, we okay. have a couple questions coming in on the chat. You look great. Um, okay. Actually, yeah. First of all, how yeah. many? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. How many people did the Peels employ at the height of their museums? What was their staff at the museums like? Minimal. I mean, minimal. Um, okay. Minimal. I mean, for the most part, it was Peel and his sons that were doing this. Um, you know, there were other people that they hired um, here and there, people that might have done a bit of the taxidermy. Um, there was, um, there were people who um, actually ran a little, there was this little um, device that you and I had talked about, Hannah. Um, where uh, you, where someone in the museum who worked for the museum would sit and could create a silhouette for visitors for about eight cents. They would use this machine to create a silhouette of the visitors and actually uh, it would make four copies of the silhouette so you could kind of give out wallet versions to, to your friends. And so they would, there would be people that would be hired for that. There might be some people who would you know, kind of clean the museum and that sort of thing, but, but the vast majority of the work was done by Peel um, and his sons, um, Raphael, and what I mentioned, and Rubens, and Rembrandt, and Titian, and, 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 um, and, and, and others. You can tell that Peel um, values both family and the Enlightenment by how many children he had and how, how he <laughs> named his sons. I was just like, oh, Rubens, that's an artist, and Titian, that, there's another one. So that's quite interesting. Um, and and he, also, he also named one of them, um, Frank, went by the name of, of Franklin for Benjamin Franklin. Um, uh, when Peel was in England studying with um, Benjamin West, he made this little sketch that became quite famous of, um, you know, um, a, a fairly elderly Benjamin Franklin, fairly young, uh, Polly Stevenson, the daughter of his landlord, sitting on his lap. And um, that became something of a, uh, I don't want to say notorious, but it was a, it, it was a little sketch that, that made the rounds. And he, I, named son, he named one of his sons after Benjamin Franklin. I love that. And I had forgotten that he did the picture of um, Franklin's cat. And I just, I, I love that uh, there's so, out there, we have one of Franklin's pets is just <laughs> immortalized. Well, it, was by actually, it was actually a specimen that was in the museum. Right. So, so Franklin, one of the... Um, one of the ladies who ran one of the parlors that loved more than anything to have Benjamin Franklin come and talk to philosophy to them, um, sent Franklin an Angora cat for Franklin to give to Peel. <laughs> the, the, the cat itself, the stuffed cat was in the museum. I, 
I both want to know and don't want to know what happened to the cat. <laughs> I can't tell you, so you're safe. Okay, great. Um, it's the Schroeder's cat of knowledge about Franklin's cat. Um, uh, most portrait painters give their portraits to their patrons. What was the idea behind the Peels displaying their portraits to the public? Right. So um, Peel did a lot of that. So um, so he he painted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of portraits and landscape, mostly portraits. And so a large number of them were really um, him making uh, a living as a portrait painter. Even when the museum was going, this was a major source of income for him so he could actually have the time to run the museum. And then there were others that he painted, um, at, um, perhaps some he painted only at one of that, um, that were designed for the museum, others where he might have painted multiple um, he might have had multiple sittings of the same person, and one of them would go to the person, and one of them would go to the museum. So he certainly was making, um, he certainly was um, being paid to do this many times um, and, and giving those to, to people, but, but, but lots of others he did just for the museum. And, and, his, and his children too. I mean, Rembrandt, his son, became, Charles Wilson Peale was regarded as, as one of the first sort of three major painters in the United States, but everybody in the art world, uh, his son Rembrandt is, is recognized as a way better painter than, than, than his father. I think I first became aware of Rembrandt Peel and then Charles Wilson Peel. I don't know, I don't know, you know, when I became aware the of the Peel. In the art world, that wouldn't be surprising. Yeah. Um, what, how does James Smithson's museum and the Smithsonian fit into all of this? Yeah, or does it? Right. So um, it, 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 I'm, I'm trying to remember, I, 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 am I right that, that Smithson um, uh, bequeathing the money to, to the United States government? I think that was the early 1850s. I'm gonna um, do some fact checking really yeah, quick, yeah. quickly here. Um, Fifty-one that he gave the money, but I could be. Uh, it's around then, and so so it doesn't really have um, a lot of overlap with 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 the Peel story. But you know that said, that's what Peel envisioned for his museum. Now a lot of the Smithson stuff. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the money was used for, for, for um, large scale ex, um, expeditions that brought in lots and lots of. of, of, of uh, I'm looking at um, the Smithsonian's um, information about Smithson now, and he lived from 1765 to 1829. So he overlapped a little bit with Peel. Okay. Um, um, just, just a little okay. bit. Um, and then he, he, he died in 1829, leaving his fortune to the United States, a place he had never visited, um, right. to found in Washington under the name of the Smithsonian Institution, an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. Right. And I, like, what I can't remember is actually when that happened. He died he, then, but he, I... He died in 1829, but I don't think the gift was made in, like, until the 1840s. I think. That's what I was saying, right. That's, yeah, that, that's I, think it, I, I think it was that. Um, but that's he was like, I, I just love that this guy who never visited the United States was like, you oh, know what, the US needs a museum. <laughs> um, There's actually a couple of really good books about that. Um, they're very well written, but they're very frustrating in the sense that um, it's very hard to, nobody can quite piece together why he did that. Um, you know, there, there are some theories, but we just don't know. Um, it looks like uh, Congress passed the legislation establishing the Smithsonian in 1846. So okay. it took about so 15, sort of 15 to 16 years to, um, to figure all that out. I imagine there was a lot to figure out. Right. Um, how in the world did he have enough time to do all of the painting um, plus collect items and publicize his museum. Well, before I answer that, let me just tell you, that was just, this guy was a true Renaissance man. What I'm telling you about is like the major thing he spent his time on, but he did so many other things that we don't have time. So he designed bridges. 
He designed all sort of apparatuses that he that he that he did that, that he would write dozens and dozens and dozens of letters back and forth with Jefferson, kicking around ideas. He he designed false teeth for people who had dental problems. He did so many different things. How did he have a time for it when he had? not all at one time, they weren't all alive at one time and many of them died very young, 17 children over the course of his life. Um, you know, I, he, he just basically devoted every minute that he had to doing this. Now, you know, he wasn't on the ground going around collecting these, uh, these, these um, specimens himself very much after the first five years or so. Most of the things that were coming in were um, the result of the hundreds of newspaper articles um, that he put out and, and, uh, and, and other ways that he publicized things. And then he would just, he and his sons would spend every waking moment cataloging these things, not to mention how, how at this time, the, uh, the taxidermy in, at, at that large a scale was really in its infancy. And he, he and his sons basically devised new ways to, to do taxidermy that would allow the specimens to be exhibited for very long periods of time. They just spent all their waking hours doing this sort of thing. Um, but it's always difficult to say how these polymaths do what they do, except that their entire existence is devoted to it. It's, it's, it sounds like it was a real family affair, which leads into oh. um, Martha Dorsey's question. What was his wife's role in his career? Um, how, how did Mrs. Peel fit into all of this? Right, so there were three such. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, I, when I was doing this, I was looking for, you know, what the women in his life were, were, you know, what role they played. I have to say that when it comes to his wife, wives, there's not a lot. So he did not write a lot. Of, he wrote a lot about them as people, but he did not write, they were not sort of actively involved in the museum, except to the extent, of course, that if they weren't doing what they were doing, Pio and his sons could never have had the time to do what they were doing. Now, I will say Peel's daughter, one of his daughters, did a number of the um, sketches um, and, and um, painting, well, I think mostly the sketches that were in the museum, but his wives did not play the um, active direct role um, that his daughter or his sons played. That's the best I can tell you because that's, that's all he wrote about. Yeah, and that's, it's interesting um, because I always laugh because Martin Van Buren was married to a woman named Hannah. And Martin Van Buren was our eighth president. He wrote a really extensive biography of his, or autobiography, and he never mentioned his wife, Hannah, once. And I'm like, so it's interesting. It's not that he may not have been a family man. He's just interests were elsewhere. <laughs> right, and, and, and again, like, I mean, Peel, there's a collection of Peel's papers um, that are beautifully annotated by historians that run 3,000, his letters run 3,000 pages and more. And he certainly wrote a lot about his family life. It's just right. that that was not directly connected, except with respect to his wives, that was not directly connected to sort of the everyday running of the museum. And there also, there could be an element of uh, privacy because of course, Martha Washington burned all of the letters um, between herself and George Washington. And we have no record of no, you know, their relationship and letters. So some things might just need to be private. <laughs> um, but if you read Peel's letters, it doesn't look like you thought about that. Okay. Much. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, where so we know that he is a naturalist we know that he is a portraitist um but beyond that was he independently wealthy and how was he funding this ultimately peel's museum uh failed because you know he didn't have the funding he needed but while it was successful what was his revenue like right so he absolutely was not independently wealthy and the revenue 
Um, early on in the museum, so from 1786, maybe for the first decade or so, um, the revenue was a combination of the portraits that he did on the side, paid portraits for people. And, and by that point, he was you know, collecting good sums for those portraits. And, um, and then, of course, there were the ticket sales. And so, um, you know, like I said, uh, the annual sales, you know, they, they were somewhere between 3,500 and 12,000. So if we took, say, you know, 8,000 maybe as a reasonable number, that's $2,000 um, in ticket sales. And, and, then there, and then there were also annual passes that he had that cost significantly more. So that was another set of revenue. Now, you know, a large chunk of that was spent in basically keeping the museum going. I mean, you know, it, it costs a lot of money to, to, to prepare these exhibits and so on. And so even when he was bringing that money in, he wasn't wealthy. He certainly didn't start independently wealthy and he was never a wealthy person. And he was very self-conscious that the public did not see him as someone who had this museum to make a fortune. Um, it, 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 over and over he writes, he, he's quite worried that people will see this. And, 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 and legitimately so, because there were some people, some of the resistance to making him a national museum was people said, well, you know, he's charging people to, to come in. And, um, and, and so, but there would have been ways around that, um, but, but, um, but he never became a wealthy person. Um, but he, you know, I love that he, he was able to pursue his passion because that's just, it's so interesting. What a gift to be able to do something that you love and involve your whole family and have people come and visit. I mean, that's the dream, right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing you, we want people to be interested in the things you're interested in. Um, uh, I had a question because you answered, um, you spoke about this already, um, a little bit about his papers. Um, he kept, did he, it sounds like he kept diaries, journals, and letters, but can you tell us a little bit about his surviving archives, and if we want to really dig into Peel and write our own book about Peel, where might we go? Sure, sure, sure. So, um, yes, so, so um, there are thousands of letters, and then there are also the uh, diaries and journals that he kept, and all of those, all of them, are in a five-volume set and if um and and it's quite easy to, to find them um they're called the collected papers of charles wilson peel and i believe yale university press is the one that did it. it it came out over the course of 20 years and and what's beautiful about these things especially as a historian of science is it's not just the collection of those things they are extraordinarily extraordinarily well annotated so, so the historians who put this together have hundreds of footnotes about things that are not in those letters, but that are relevant to that letter, right? Or, or that, you know, we don't have the response to this letter, but here's the letter. Um, and then whenever Peel mentions somebody in a letter, the annotated notes on the bottom of the page by the historians who put this together will tell you who that person was and why they were important in the letter. So it's beautifully done. Beautifully done. I know what I'm putting on my Christmas list for next year. Um, I it's love, also, I, I to say it's it's um it's uh the the collected papers altogether are not a cheap buy. Um, I mean, they're each one of them are more like you know seventy five or eighty dollars. Um, but I should also say right that um. For example, all of Peel's letters with Jefferson and Adams and um, Monroe and Washington, all of these things are available um, online at the Founders Archive uh, that the United States, uh, that the, I guess, I'm not quite sure, it's, it's a government run site, I can't think of the- Library of Congress? Has well, it's- like founder, it's oh oh yeah, founders.org. Founders.org is through the National Archives and the Library of Congress, and it has all of these great. Um, it has all of Jefferson's papers, all of um, Adams, all of Jefferson's papers, all of Washington's papers, all of papers like that, and and so a lot of the letters that were between those people and Peel, are okay. like, not all of Peel's letters. He doesn't. He is sort of what I think of. Um, 
as a kind of second tier founder. You know, he's not Washington and Jefferson and Adams and Monroe, but he's like, he, both in terms of um, reputation and, um, and, 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 and sort of impact at the political level, but he's sort of on that second tier, I would say, with that people don't know as well, people like Thomas Paine and Alexander, well, people know Hamilton, but not really. Um, so so um, uh, I mean, th he's, that, he's right below that tier. So his papers aren't all on, on, the, on the Library of Congress site, but the ones to Jefferson and Washington and so on are. Website, the website is, I misstated it, it's um, sponsored by the National Archives, it's called Founders Online. Um, I just put a link in the chat, but it's founders.archives.gov um, and Peel appears in 592 search results. So, yeah, and be careful, very, I'm glad you said that, be careful because if you type in founders.something, you get some, you get something very odd. That, that yes. has nothing to do with I, I, yes. you have to, we, sometimes there's a lot of things that are connected. Um, what it was the Peel's relationship with the Lewis and Clark expedition? Great. I wish, you know, there were so many things I wanted to talk to you about. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, Peel wasn't involved directly in that expedition, although he was involved in um, an expedition that happened 10 years earlier that was sort of the, um, a version of what would have been the Lewis and Clark um, uh, expedition 10 years earlier that failed um, by a fellow, a French botanist by the name of André Michaud. He, Peel was involved in that, but he wasn't involved directly with sponsoring or doing anything with Lewis and Clark when they went out. But when Lewis and Clark began sending specimens back, mostly through Jefferson, basically Jefferson kept the ones that he really wanted um, and exhibited them. He gave some to the American Philosophical Society, but the Peel Philadelphia Museum was the public face of most of the exhibits of Lewis and Clark. So they had a lot of them there starting in, I guess, about 1807, 1808. Um, and so Peel and Jefferson were exchanging lots of letters about this, right? Um, and as I say, you know, Jefferson didn't give Peel all of them, but he gave, but it was, it, if the public was going to see them in any regular fashion, it was at Peel's Museum, Philadelphia. Okay. Um, speaking of which, what happened to the collections of Peel's Museum? Right. Can we so, still see them? Right. Um, so what I was saying at the end was that after Barnum bought, um, after Barnum bought up all of the Peel museums, it's a little bit tr tricky to, to track everything. But the assumption is, and we know to some extent, that many of those things went to Barnum's Museum in New York and the one, the smaller one in Philadelphia, and both of those burned down. And so the assumption is that most of the things that were in the Peel museums are lost, but some of them that um, that Barnum's partner Moses Kimball got ended up in the uh, at at the Anthropology Museum at Harvard. So if you go there today, it's not a giant um, collection, but it's the largest collection that exists of what was in the Peel Museum. That, that that's the um, natural history and ethnography and anthropology stuff. The, the, the paintings, the portraits that were up, most of them are now um, either at the National Portrait Gallery or at museums in Philadelphia or um, at the second National Bank in Philadelphia. They're all over Philadelphia. You can't go into a major place in Philadelphia without seeing them. Um, okay. Um, and then his son Rembrandt um, became the director of the Pennsylvania Academy of Art um, can you talk a little bit about what happened to Rembrandt and his sons after um, after Peel's death? Just give us a little taste of the second generation. Right. So, it, so you're right that Rembrandt, but it was Rembrandt and Charles Wilson Peel that started the PAFA, the Pennsylvania Academy of, of, of Fine Arts. Um, Rembrandt for a while ran um, the Peel Museum in Baltimore, um, but but. Um, you know, after a while, like I say, he got tired of it. It wasn't making money. Eventually, Barnum built, bought it, and and Rembrandt Peel basically spent his time um, doing 
paintings and uh, and the like, and 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 became. And he also spent time in Europe studying painting, and um, and and so um, he primarily devoted his life to art. Um, Rubens also was a painter, um, but not nearly as as famous. Um, one of his other sons, Raphael. Um, was um, was also a painter. Um, Franklin, who I mentioned briefly um, in the question and answer, became actually the head of, I believe it was, I think it was Fra Franklin Peel. Yeah, Franklin Peel became um, head of the United States Mint. Um, uh, and I am um, just trying to think of uh, um, uh, Titian. Titian um, after the museums closed, um, you know, I don't know a lot about. I, I, I'd have to relook at that. That's my notes okay. About That's okay. He had seventeen children, so you covered right. you covered quite right. a few of them. Right, Raphael. Well, Ra Rembrandt was the most famous. Uh, Rubens and Raphael were also quite good um, in terms of, uh, of being artists, and um, Rubens was basically a museum director as well. I'm going to have to uh, look up, um, I'm going to have to look up some of his children because I found a listing of their names and he has a daughter named Sophonispa, which, right. Sophonispa, so, I can't even pronounce it. Right. She's the one that I mentioned earlier who actually did some of the sketches and art that was Hey, because I was like, I need to know more about this person. Um, yeah. We have a question um, about, you know, Peel is um, a great believer in the Enlightenment. What is his yes. relationship with um, contemporaries who were of a religious background and some of the advertisements, particularly the advertisement that mentions the Shining Book of Nature? I think the Shining Sacred Book of Nature. Um, what was, was there an interplay there between um, the religion of the day and the Enlightenment ideals? Um, yeah, to the extent that, um, you know, Peel, I think, um, I'm not, I, you know, I don't think he actually ever used the word to describe himself because it was not something that you floated around lightly at that time. But I think um, any reasonable reading of Peel is um, a deist, meaning that he certainly thought there was a creator um, and he certainly was doing what he was doing in part to um, shine light on what his creator had done. But he was a deist in the sense that he didn't, you know, he wasn't somebody who thought on a day-to-day -day basis that his creator was affecting what was happening in your life. In terms of religion in general, I mean, he basically, you know, he stayed away from it um, in, in, uh, publicly, like Jefferson. And, um, you know, the only time he would ever sort of mention religion per se would be when he would write something and he would say that the museum, I can't, I, don't, I can't remember the exact quotes, but it'd be something like, the museum is a place for people of all political backgrounds, of all religions, of all faiths, creeds, whatever. So, so he was, um, you know, it was not something he talked a lot about publicly. And again, privately, it, you know, it, it's very clear from his writings that, I, that, that today we would refer to him as a deist. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, are there any homes or buildings or monuments to Peel or any places in Philadelphia where we can um, remember him? Or do we just remember him through his paintings and lively contributions to our early American Republic? Yeah, I think it's it's going in Philadelphia and, um, and in Washington, it's going to be primarily through those paintings. So his house, um, well, you know what, though, I, I take that, that, that there is one place that you could go, um, even today, that would get you a much more direct connection to Peel. And that is that in his later life, after he retired, um, he, in addition to having a home in Philadelphia, bought this um, large farm um, out about 10 or 15 miles out of um, Philadelphia. And today that, that, that the, the house, um, that the farmhouse still exists and it, it, it's, it's there um, for people to come and visit. Um, it's, but it, it, it's not, you know, it's not central Philadelphia. It's not where he was doing the museum stuff. It's where he went afterwards and sort of had his later years. And I, I'm trying to remember there, which university 
is in Philadelphia that recently sort of bought it and made it a public place. But um, it is oh, it is called Belfield. That's right. And um, uh, I um, yeah I could find LaSalle. It's LaSalle University. <laughs> I. I have very fast Googling fingers um, for, for, for fact checking. Um, if you have, oh, go ahead. The Belfield was the name of it. What do you call it? Okay. Um, yes. So um, Philadelphia is one of my favorite cities. And I only on my last visit to Philadelphia, right before the pandemic, um, did I first hear about Peel as anything other than a painter. So I'm quite ashamed of myself. But now, next time I will go to Philadelphia post pandemic, I have a whole list of other Peel related places um, to visit. Um, if you do have any final questions, please leave them in the chat. Um, but I have a question for you. Um, if you could have one artifact from Peel's museum in your home, what would it be and why? Oh, oh I mean, so there is no question that I would want a mastodon okay. from the museum. So hang on, hang on one second. So this, oh my goodness, show and tell. So this is not actually from the Peel Museum, but it is a 10,000 year old fossil, um, um, mammoth fossil that, that I acquired, but it's not, um, or actually it's probably a little bit older than that, but it's, it's unfortunately it's not from uh, the Peel Museum itself. So, but it is in another spot in my study. I had a feeling that the mastodon bone was going to be your answer. Um, I think mine is, I can't remember the name of it now, but the, oh. the, the silhouette mu machine. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on one second. <laughs> I'll be right there. <laughs> He's gonna give it, the silhouette mu uh, machine is basically like the 18th century version of a photo booth. And I can't remember I the have, name of it. I have one of the ones that were made in Peel's museum. Oh, and wow. There were about 8,000 of them made. And so this, you could actually buy one. Um, you know, again, they're not, they're not cheap, but you can buy them on eBay. And, but, you, but you really want to be careful because there are a lot of fakes. Um, okay. And then I have, now this is going to be a little trickier to see. Um, but this is actually um, this is actually a coin that served as the annual pass to the museum in 1825. That's so cool. When the pandemic is over, um, I think we should all take a field trip to the Peel's Museum Dugatkin Annex. We'll just go. <laughs> If you talk to my friends, you will know there is nothing I like more than getting a tour of my study. So um, we will, we will, we will have to get our staff and volunteers and members just to line up outside your door once it's safe to do so. Um, Dr. Dugatkin, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, thank you to our sponsors, PNC Bank and John and Jeannie Vizo for sponsoring our Living Room Lecture Series. Um, we will be emailing out a link to um, Dr. Dugatkin's website where you can purchase all of his books, um, including his book on uh, Peel's Museum. Um, and uh, please stay tuned for our next Living Room Lecture um, coming up uh, in just a couple weeks. So please stay tuned as we announce that. Don't forget to join the Locust Grove email list so you can be first um, to sign up for the book sale. Um, and Dr. Dugatkin, thank you for such a lovely evening. It was wonderful to spend time with you in Peel's Museum. It was my pleasure and thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Good night, bye. Bye-bye.